Satanists converge on a city in Los Angeles County. UFO truth seekers head for California's high desert, and European dignitaries attend a pagan ritual to celebrate the opening of a tunnel. This is Skywatch TV for Tuesday, June 7th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. First up today, Muslims celebrated the beginning of the month of Ramadan Monday. More than a billion people around the world begin a month of abstention. No eating, drinking, smoking, or physical relations between dawn and dusk. For many of them in the Middle East, especially Iraq and Syria, the month will again be under the cloud of war. Newly elected Muslim mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, wrote an op-ed piece for the Guardian newspaper there, said that Ramadan provides an opportunity to break bread and build bridges between communities. President Obama, weighing in on the start of Ramadan, used the opportunity to take another shot at Donald Trump without mentioning him by name, saying that the U.S. will continue to welcome immigrants and refugees, including those who are Muslim. Donald Trump's presumptive opponent in the upcoming presidential election is Hillary Clinton. Associated Press last night, Monday, announced that their count of delegates and superdelegates to the Democratic Convention gives her enough votes to lock up the Democratic nomination. Now, the timing of the announcement was a little curious, though. The uh, Bernie Sanders campaign responded very quickly, um, calling it a rush to judgment. You see, today, Tuesday, was supposed to be an important primary vote in the state of California, where Sanders had eliminated a double-digit lead by Hillary Clinton. The two were running neck and neck. Now, AP figures Clinton has 2,383 delegates committed to her, exactly the number that she needs to win. But 571 of those delegates are superdelegates who are free to change their minds when they get to the convention. And the ongoing FBI investigation into the uh, use of her private email server to misuse documents marked top secret might convince some or all of them to switch. In other words, it appears that the announcement by the AP, which was quickly followed by other news outlets, was perhaps intended to discourage Sanders supporters in California from bothering to vote. Still, unless something unexpected happens, like the FBI finally pushes the Department of Justice, which is a part of the executive branch under the control of Barack Obama, uh, decides to actually indict Hillary Clinton for doing something that would have put you and me behind bars a long time ago. Uh, Hillary Clinton has apparently made history as the first woman to win the presidential nomination from a major political party in American history. Well, politics all over the world, just as interesting, for example, in um, Israel. Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas over the last few months has been telling folks on uh, PA television that the Bible says Palestinians were in the land before Abraham. Now let's examine this claim. Uh, he believes that because Genesis 21:34 says Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines, which is where the word Palestinian comes from, Philistine, Palestine, you know, the pronunciation has changed over time. Uh, so he believes the Palestinians were there first. Now, consider that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were written by Moses long after the fact for readers in Moses' day. He was identifying a geographic location that had come to be identified with the Philistines, who most archaeologists believe didn't even arrive until the invasions by uh, people from the Aegean called the Sea Peoples. It was a confederation of different peoples. Just one of them were called the Peleset, the Palestinians, the Philistines. So the Palestinians, if they were these people, didn't arrive until probably seven or 800 years after Abraham. But that's beside the point, because the, the Peleset, the Philistines, were probably from the Aegean, meaning they were basically Greek. No relation to the modern day Palestinian Arabs. But spreading this disinformation serves a political agenda for Mahmoud Abbas and his supporters, which is, of course, denying Israel's right to the land. Now, based on the logic of Mr. Abbas, and since I am um, in small part Welsh, one Welsh ancestor who emigrated in the late 17th century, uh, I demand that all Anglo-Saxons leave England now and return the land to my ancestors. Of course, that creates another problem because I'm also in large part English. 
and Swedish, and the Vikings had some dealings in England back. I'm just going to pay myself reparations, and the rest of you can figure it out. Mr. Abbas, you can take it up with Yahweh, the God of the Bible, who declared the land was for the descendants of Abraham through the son of the promise, Isaac. Back to actual news, uh, more proof that evil is real, and I mean in a non-corporeal but still very real form, a story that we see all too often, at least several times a year, a mother accused of murdering her own children. In Phoenix, a mother of three is in custody for allegedly stabbing her three young sons to death and stuffing their partially dismembered bodies into a closet in a suitcase before turning the knife on herself. 29-year-old Octavia Rogers allegedly murdered, dismembered, eight-year-old Jakari Rahman, five-year-old Jeremiah Adams, and two-month-old Avery Robinson, all of them her sons, and then stabbing herself in the neck and abdomen, claiming that she was pregnant. She's in critical condition at a hospital, but is expected to survive. Now, in my opinion, this is not something that one does, a parent taking the life of his or her child without external provocation. But as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. In other words, Ms. Rogers may have felt that her situation was hopeless, but that is not unique to Ms. Rogers. She's not been tempted in a way that others have not also been tempted. But without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, your ability to withstand that temptation is non-existent or may be non-existent, and taking a knife to your children and then to yourself appears to be a viable option when your circumstances seem hopeless. And sadly, in a world where death is considered by experts an acceptable treatment for suffering, we are going to see more of this, I believe. The Journal of Medical Ethics recently published an article addressing this question, should happy people suffering from dementia, Alzheimer's, be euthanized? The three authors of the article from Germany and the Netherlands, where assisted suicide is rapidly becoming socially acceptable, argue that people who've made arrangements in advance to be euthanized, to commit suicide with the assistance of a doctor, if they develop dementia, but then when dementia sets in, appear to be happy in spite of their condition, should be put to death anyway. Their argument is that their change in cognitive abilities means that they are no longer responsible for their change of mind. They're unable to rationally change the set of values that led them to express a desire for assisted suicide in the first place. So in other words, even though a patient who develops dementia appears to be happy, has a reasonably good quality of life, and is no longer requesting life-ending treatment, and the mere fact that they would use the word treatment for suicide is disturbing enough. The authors argue that caregivers should not refrain from euthanizing the patient according to his or her prior wishes because the patient's true wishes were expressed before the onset of dementia and the current wishes of the patient are basically just the disease talking. This is disturbing, but it's not surprising in a culture that has abandoned the idea that human life has intrinsic value because we are all created as God's imagers. And it is going to get worse as the idea that we're just living in a simulation, a hologram, becomes more and more widespread. Elon Musk, one of the most intelligent and innovative people of our time, possibly the inspiration for the character played by Robert Downey Jr. in the Iron Man movies, uh, said at a tech conference this week that there is a one in billions chance that we're actually living in what he calls base reality. That it is more likely that we are living in someone's simulation. That we're all just blips in somebody's video game. This isn't a concept that's new to Musk. Some very intelligent people have floated the idea that an advanced civilization, sufficiently advanced, may create a very realistic simulation to better understand their primitive ancestors. Those primitives being us. 
Just as researchers today use computer models to simulate, say, migration patterns of birds or diseases or uh, ancient humans. And there are some disturbing complications of this idea that we are all just part of a massive computer simulation. For one, if our reality is just a computer game, then there are no consequences to our actions because nothing's real. This is an attitude that's spreading amongst our kids and grandkids. We have an interview coming in a couple of weeks with Opal Singleton, the CEO of MillionKids.org, about how video games are changing the attitudes of our children and grandchildren towards behavior that you and I would consider sinful. The second consequence of this idea that we're all just living in a simulation is the fear that the creator of the simulation must, might decide to just reboot the whole thing and wipe everything out. Here's a news flash for Mr. Musk and others who think this way. We Christians know the creator of the game, and he's left us his rules in the form of the Bible. And he is absolutely going to hit the reboot button one of these days, and you'd best be on his good side when he does. But whether the reset or the reboot comes to us individually in the form of death, or collectively when Jesus returns, we will all be part of Earth 2.0. The only question is where you're going to spend the rest of time. And by the way, this is not a simulation. This is how we were created and where we, we were created to be. Um, sadly, though, there are still groups of people out there who um, are confused about who or what is responsible for putting us here on Earth 1.0. About 3,000 people attended the annual Contact in the Desert UFO Festival at Joshua Tree, California over the weekend. The event ended yesterday, Monday. Featured speakers, a who's who among ufology, Giorgio Tsokolos of Ancient Aliens, Eric Von Donikin, George Norrie, the host of Coast to Coast AM, Whitley Strieber, Graham Hancock, David Hatcher Childress, David Jacobs, Linda Moulton Howe, David Wilcock, Jim Marr, Stanton Friedman. Um, again, a who's who among ufologists. Uh, and the people who attend events like this one are searching for answers. And I'm not talking about answers to the engineering problems of how you can harness enough energy to fly between the stars or uh, survive deadly radiation in interstellar space when you're traveling at some multiple of the speed of light. They see this as a spiritual quest. The answers of why are we here <laughs> and where do we go when we die? And they attend events like this because we Christians have not adequately addressed the problem, addressed their concerns, and we've left the field. We've left the field to the New Agers. And in Los Angeles County, another group, the Satanic Temple, successfully getting into the news once again. Monday being 6616, get it? Took GPS and laid out a giant pentagram over the city of Lancaster, California, which is about 70 miles north of Los Angeles. Their goal to raise awareness for Satanism. And in Switzerland, a massive tunnel project was officially opened last week with a bizarre ritual that uh, sure looked to my untrained eyes pagan. The Gothard Base Tunnel is the longest and most expensive tunnel in the history. It's about 35 miles long, cost about $12 billion, cuts through the Swiss Alps, took 17 years to complete. At the opening ceremony last week, another who's who gathering. German Chancellor Angela Merkel, French President Francois Hollande, Italy's Prime Minister Matteo Renzi. The festivities were developed by a German theatrical producer, featured a man dressed as a goat, presiding over a strange ritual, people uh, dressed in white, white underwear, basically, uh, representing the masses who will pass through the tunnel. There were a number of other very weird scenes and uh, images. I won't show you many of the pictures because, frankly, some of these are just overtly sexual in nature. But um, the things that caught my eye were, of course, the man dressed as the goat being followed around by what appear to be acolytes who then bow down in veneration to this. Um, I think we can get caught up in trying to overanalyze this, but just the imagery of this goat man being venerated reminds me of Leviticus 17 and the goat demons that the Israelites worshipped while they were in the desert 
after escaping Egypt, the Seirim. God condemned them for this practice. Leviticus 17, 7. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons, Seirim, after whom they whore. Now these goat demons may have been an aspect of the Egyptian god Set, who is known as the god of the wilderness, the desert, and also the god of foreign nations, which to the Egyptians, the Israelites were. In fact, God commanded the Israelites for atonement purposes, to take two goats, sacrifice one to Yahweh, and then to drive another out into the desert, into the wilderness, on which the sins of the tribes have been placed, that goat for Azazel. Now, it's from this ritual that we get the concept of the scapegoat, the goat that bears the blame for all that we've done wrong. Now, of course, according to the book of Enoch, Azazel was also the name of one of the watchers who came down and descended upon Mount Hermon, He and Samyaza led the rebellion that culminated in the creation of the Nephilim. Azazel also, in the book of Enoch, taught women the art of deception by ornamenting the body, dyeing the hair, painting the face and eyebrows, revealed the secrets of witchcraft, taught men the art of warfare, of making swords, knives, shields, coats of mail, and as such was punished. But the worship of goat demons or goat gods continued long after Moses, In the period just after King David, Jeroboam, who led the rebellion of the northern tribes against Solomon's son Rehoboam, set up calf and goat idols on high places for the apostate northern Israelites to worship and to sacrifice to without having to go to Jerusalem and fall back under the influence of the king of Judah. And even into the Roman period, the time of Jesus, there was a cave at a place called Benias or Penias, as in Pan, the Greek goat god, a cave called the Grotto of Pan at the foot of Mount Hermon, where the watchers descended. And it was right there where Jesus, not coincidentally, made the famous statement, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not a coincidence. Jesus knew exactly where he was and what he was doing. But here we are 2,000 years later, and it appears that a mountain in the Swiss Alps has just been consecrated to Pan or Azazel or Set, who, incidentally, was equated with Baal, Baal, the Canaanite god, who Jesus identified as Satan. This week on Skywatch TV, a fascinating discussion with Richard Shaw, the film producer, uh, who, of course, uh, teams up with L.A. Marzulli for the Watchers series of DVDs. Richard Shaw has produced a film called Torah Codes, End to Darkness. Is it possible that God encoded into the Hebrew Bible, the first five books, the Torah, messages that are only now coming to light with advanced computer technology and algorithms? You'll see that program multiple times tonight. Again tomorrow, Coast to Coast on the Cornerstone Network. And again on Saturday on the Victory Television Network and WCLF-TV in the Tampa area. For a complete listing of dates and times to watch Skywatch TV, log on to skywatchtv.com and then click the link in the top menu bar there that says Channels. And this week, we begin ramping up the exclusive web content on skywatchtv.com. We've got a second interview with Richard Shaw that we couldn't fit into the network television schedule. It's available, but only as a web exclusive. You'll find it at the Skywatch TV channel on Roku, our YouTube channel, and of course linked at skywatchtv.com. Speaking of the interwebs, it can bring the Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference into your living room. The live stream is available again this year. 26 speakers, 40 messages now, 40 messages available in real time and in crystal clear full HD and all presentations archived for six weeks after the conference. To find out more and to sign up, log on to prophecywatchers.com. Your support is critical to us here at Skywatch TV. During the month of June, books for dad, just in time for Father's Day, The Fisherman's Guide to Life and The Man in the Mirror, Solving the Problems Men Face. We will send those books to you for your donation of any amount during the month of June. Canada and U.S. only, please. But uh, to find out more and to donate, log on to skywatchtv.com slash donate. And of course, you can help us just by clicking the mouse. Click share, click like, 
And if you're watching this on YouTube, click that subscribe button down there. Or down there, I forget which corner it's in. But the little red thing, you'll see it. And of course, if you've got uh, comments or questions for me about what we do here at Skywatch TV, send those to dgilbert at skywatchtv.com. And thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. Save nearly half off the cover price when you subscribe now to the brand new Skywatch TV magazine. For a limited time from April 24th through June 24th, 60 days only, a five-year subscription to Skywatch TV magazine is just $99. That's more than $75 off the cover price, which is like getting two years for free. Exclusive content, articles on prophecy, discovery and the supernatural from Tom Horn, Chris Putnam, Josh Peck, science updates from Sharon K. Gilbert, geopolitics from yours truly, and guest writers like Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist Troy Anderson, renowned Bible scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, Pentagon advisor Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, and more. But there is more. As an early subscriber, you'll be the first to get this new book from Defender Publishing, I Predict What 12 Global Experts Believe You'll See by 2025. This is a $20 value and includes best-selling authors like Joel Richardson, Mark Biltz, Carl Gallops, Tom Horn, Paul McGuire, and more. Find out what they think about the coming war between ISIS and the Vatican, the future of the Temple Mount, and the Ark of the Covenant a worldwide manifestation of angels and the coming age of human hybrids. And we'll also add this DVD, the best of Skywatch TV 2015, a $25 value, including our most compelling interviews from last year, including Chuck Missler, Steve Quayle, the discussion of the Georgia Guidestones with Chris Pinto, and more. All of this together worth more than $200, yours now for just $99, but only through June 24th. Subscribe now, Skywatch TV Magazine. Just call the number on your screen or log on to skywatchtvstore.com.